Upon completion of his PhD, Dr. Frank worked for several years as a teaching assistant and then a research associate before getting an appointment as an assistant professor in the Department of Physiology at the George Washington University Medical Center in Washington, D.C. Since 1978, Dr. Frank has been an associate professorial lecturer in the Department of Pharmacology and Physiology at the George Washington Medical Center. Dr. Frank is also the current executive director of the American Physiological Society, which he plays a, cr a critical role in guiding an immense organization with over 10,000 members, 70 staff, and an annual budget of $38 million. He has served as director of the APS since 1985. Dr. Frank has received numerous awards and honors throughout his career, including recognition as a distinguished alumnus from the Department of Molecular and Integrative Physiology from the University of Illinois. He, he also maintains several professional society memberships in addition to his affiliation with the APS, including the Society for Scholarly Publishing and the Council of Engineering and Scientific Society Executives. Dr. Frank has a dozen publications, a book chapter, and over 30 additional publications, including numerous editorials written for the physiologists uh, listed on the CV. We're fortunate to have Dr. Frank here to visit with us today, and I'll now hand it over to him in a seminar entitled The Spectrum of Career Opportunities. Jack, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, it is my pleasure to be down here. Uh, I have had the pleasure of visiting New Orleans a number of times. Uh, I am here ostensibly because Patricia Molina, Chair of Physiology, is my incoming president to the American Physiological Society. And one of the things I like to do is come down, meet with the president-elect, find out what grief they're going to give me during their presidential <laughs> term. And so, so far she has, you know, I just got in a little while ago, so I haven't gotten the full list of things that are going to happen. I also think New Orleans, I've been here a number of times, obviously we have Gabby Navarre here uh, in the front. Gabby was president uh, 1997. Okay, I was trying, I, Patricia and I were talking because you and Aubrey and Vernon were all, Aubrey Taylor and Vernon Bishop, uh, all around the same time. It, it's part of what we call the Guytonian core of APS presidents, all those folks who trained with Arthur Guyton at uh, Jackson at some point in time. Uh, what I am here for is really to uh, talk to you. Uh, I see a lot of young faces. Uh, of course, uh, as I might say, everybody in this room is young except for Gabby, uh, <laughs> relative to me. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, here is each of you is pursuing a goal and an aspiration. Uh, I know when I started out, and we'll talk about it in my talk, my expectation was I was going to be an absent-minded professor somewhere. Clearly, I did not fulfill my dream. And I think the important thing is we all have dreams, uh, but dreams change and opportunities change. And so I think my message as we go through this is take, take what's presented to you and and, and as the saying goes, uh, convert that lemon into lemonade, because everything is going to be a success for you. So what I want to start out with is just to talk to you a little bit about society, not the global society. What I want to talk to you about is societies for which I run, the American Physiological Society, and the countless other academic associations and societies that are out there that some of you may wish to become members of. Uh, clearly, you're not all physiologists as much as I would like that to be the case, uh, but I will do what I have to do as executive director, and I will make the pitch that each and every one of you should become a member of the American Physiological Society. Uh, so I've now paid for my trip down here by having you join the society, so that's the good news. But why do we as scientists and students join the societies? And we do that to exchange scientific information at scientific meetings, to access content of the society's journals, to keep in touch with the community of scientists in any given discipline, to support the disciplinary science community, and to keep in touch with developments in the field. So that's the purpose of society. Societies play a very significant role of, within your professional development. Uh, if you go to the APS website, you will see that it includes lots of information about career-related services, 
Uh, we promote scientific interaction. We provide a vehicle for communication. And we encourage you to use knowledge of a field for a common good. And the society, however, can only play that role if you as an individual is willing to be active within that society. Now, which society should you choose? Uh, clearly, I've already told you which one you should join. Uh, you could choose any of these, and there are countless others there as well. But these are mostly societies that uh, I interact with, both through FASA and within the Washington, D.C. community. But there's lots of organizations to choose from. But let me tell, me tell you a little bit about the American Physiological Society. And if I may ask for a show of hands, how many of you are APS members? I like that. There's a few I don't see hands going up. I, I think you didn't raise your hand, did you? Yes, but. That's what I said, you didn't raise your hand. But, but you know, all pharmacology. Pharmacology is just applied physiology. It's physiology and drugs. Well, that's, well, that's for any of us, right? <coughs> or is it physiologists on drugs? <coughs> Anyways, uh, APS has about 11,000 members. Uh, we publish 14 scientific journals. Uh, most recently, we launched a new journal in partnership with our si sister society, the Physiological Society, called Physiological Reports. It's an open access journal. Uh, we publish Comprehensive Physiology, and for those of you who are old enough to remember the handbooks of physiology, Comprehensive Physiology is um, what Charlie Tipton used to call the living, breathing handbook of physiology. It's continually being updated as opposed to a static textbook size uh, booklet. And we do a number of monographs uh, with Springer, and I think we just published our third one. Uh, which is a book by Jack Rawl about uh, muscle uh, physiology and the history of muscle physiology. Our annual meeting is Experimental Biology. Uh, it's coming up uh, March 28th through April 1st in Boston, uh, where you will get to experience winter, uh, no doubt. Uh, and we have a number of specialty conferences. We have K through 12 continuing education programs. Obviously, science policy, biomedical research funding is clearly what's most critical for each and every one of us today uh, in our careers and our success, as well as the humane use of animals in research and teaching. And we also have a communications program, and hopefully all of you are following us on Facebook and Twitter, uh, but we also have a web page called physiologyinfo.org, which is really designed for the public to help them understand how physiology relates to common medical practice in everyday uh, living. Uh, the APS is strongly committed to students and to mentoring. Uh, in 2003, we received a presidential award for excellence in science, math, and engineering mentoring. Uh, that Paysman Award really recognized us for our efforts in minority uh, promotion, promoting the training of minority students. Uh, career mentoring, uh, which we do from elementary through established investigators. Uh, advocacy, uh, which is what we do in terms of science policy. And a number of you I know have taken part in our professional skills training courses. Uh, one which we introduced last year, which was ethics, and uh, one that we do on a very regular basis, which is on uh, publishing, uh, writing, and reviewing for scientific journals. Uh, the Minority website uh, provides ample resources for minority trainees, awards and fellowships, career development materials, and teacher and faculty opportunities for interaction. Uh, one of the things I would note uh, here, and I think it's, it's very important, uh, is resources for minority trainees. The American Physiological Society, which was founded in 1887, uh, started providing pre-doctoral, post-doctoral fellowship support for minority students in 1968, uh, which predated the launch of the MARC program at the NIGMS. And it's one of the hallmarks of the society that I'm, that I'm most proud of, is our long-standing commitment to the training of underrepresented minority students and fellows. Uh, the career mentoring site, uh, has a number of things in there, career choices and planning, mentoring and being mentored, 
professional networking, presenting research, speaking, and writing for papers and grants. Uh, there's information in there about job search and interviews, managing the lab and personnel, teaching, advancement and pro promotion, and balancing career and family. Uh, one of the things that appears in our newsletter, if you haven't uh, seen it, it comes out every other month, but the physiologist has a, a, a column called the mentoring form. It also appears on the mentoring site, and it gives advice from other physiologists about very aspect, various aspects of your career and career development. Uh, in terms of advocacy, clearly the main issue for all of us today is trying to get funding for biomedical research. Uh, and it is clearly one thing that we can do in Bethesda, uh, in proximity to Washington. Uh, but it's something that each of us should make a commitment to do. Uh, I ask you to go to FASAB's website uh, FASAB has a uh, website where they will send out alerts to you and encourage you to write about legislation. And if you're not part of that, uh, do sign up because I think it is critically important for you to get involved. It's easier for you to say here in New Orleans to talk to your elected leaders and tell them what you're doing and why it's important that funding should exist uh, for biomedical research as opposed to some other program. Uh, it's harder for me to do it from Bethesda and from Washington, D.C. Uh, but there are things on the website that can help you do that. Bioscience briefings, benefits of biomedical research. There's an advocacy resource kit that I encourage you to take a look at and prepare yourself so when you do go to visit your elected official, whether it's here locally or in Washington, D.C., you're prepared to talk to them. There are government resources, links to other advocacy sites, and other opportunities at the experimental biology meeting. So Jacques has told you a little bit about my career path. I will embellish upon it a little bit before we start talking about careers. Um, as noted, I got my PhD in physiology from the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana, Illinois. Uh, and I will tell you, getting a PhD was not my first choice. Uh, I actually had, uh, for those of you uh, who looked at uh, my CV or anything, uh, I grew up in the Vietnam era. Uh, and some of us didn't want to go to Vietnam. And uh, so I did all I could to avoid going to Vietnam. Uh, and I, I applied to medical school. But in the infinite wisdom of the powers that be, they decided, Sorry, kid, you're not going to medical school. And that's probably because a lot of people were trying to get into medical school at the time. Uh, so I started a project, I had started a project my senior year uh, where I was working with a faculty member in Illinois doing kidney perfusion in dogs with Florimer chemicals uh, to see if Florimer chemicals in emotion could sustain viability of uh, kidneys and ultimately be used as a perfusion preparing the kidneys for transplant. I stayed on and did my master's work with uh, Don Badger and as I soon discovered the politics of academia, uh, Don did not get tenure. And so by the time I finished my master's, I had to find somebody else to do my doctoral degree. And I ended up going to work with Bill Slater, who was a chair of physiology at the time down at Illinois, and started doing EC coupling in cardiac muscle with guinea pig atria, working with an alkaloid that became the silver bullet for the calcium channel, but that was post Marty Frank, uh, and that was Ryanity. Uh, and I remember the first time I went to a meeting where Sid Fleischer was talking about Ryanidine and the calcium feet in the SR, and I was saying, that could have been me, uh, but it wasn't. Uh, I went and did two postdocs, and one of the things I discovered, and, and many of you, when you get your doctorate, you go out and look, go looking for a postdoc. Oftentimes, whoever you go to work with is going to want you to come in to the lab day one and begin working feverishly. Uh, so they may be looking for somebody who already knows all the methodology that's needed to be working in the lab. 
And I actually looked at a postdoc uh, with a guy named J.O. Davis from Missouri because I wanted to get the back into whole animal kidney physiology. Uh, and I had a great interview. And then I sat down with J.O. as my last uh, interview for the day and basically said, I don't want you. Because I had been doing guinea pig atria, fractionating tissue, things like that. He wanted somebody who could come in and do a cut down on the dog immediately and perfuse a kidney without having to be trained. And I looked at him, and as Patricia knows, as Gabby knows, and a few of you who are more senior members, I can be a smart answer. And I basically said, you know, uh, postdoc is a learning experience. I'm coming to learn, I'm not coming to be your technician. The gratifying thing was about a month after I accepted my postdoc at Michigan Cancer Foundation, I got a call from J.O. Davis offering me a position. And I think the real thing there for me, even though in my view my postdoc at Michigan Cancer Foundation, at Michigan Cancer Foundation was a disaster, I actually considered it a toxic environment. And you'll run into that situation. Uh, but ethically, I didn't feel I could say no to the Cancer Foundation because I already said yes. And so I abided by my agreement. I went to the Cancer Foundation and ultimately ended up going to Michigan State University where I went back to doing EC coupling with cardiac muscle, uh, working with Ted Brody and Ty Akira who were working with cardiac glycosides and granitizing uh, to see the impact on uh, the electrophysiology in the heart. Uh, but I discovered something else. Because I was scrambling to get myself out of Cancer Foundation, I was looking for jobs. And lo and behold, I said I was going off to Michigan Cancer or to Michigan State University when all of a sudden I got a call and asking me to come to GW to interview for a faculty job. And I went for the interview, they made me an offer, and I decided a bird in the hand was better than two in the bush and ended up accepting the job to go to the GW. Uh, hindsight's 2020, uh, and I say that because probably had I stayed in Michigan State for a couple of years, you would not be hearing a talk from me today as Executive Director of the American Physiological Society, because we go where the opportunities present themselves, so you have to be prepared. Uh, but I went to GW, and as I tell people, what happened to me at GW is I got bit by what I call Potomac Fever. Uh, had I been in Podunk, Iowa, reading about what was, who was listening to the radio, hearing about who was in the hospital or what was on sale at the local IGA, uh, besides driving myself crazy uh, in that environment, I would probably still be a faculty member. But I went to, to GW, uh, and one of the things I do have to give you advice of, when you take a job, look at the cost of living for when you move. Okay. Uh, I made, and I hate to say this now because you're all making more than I am as graduate students, but I made $14,000 as a research assistant uh, or as a postdoc at Michigan State, and I got a 25% increase in my salary to $17,000 at GW, which is in Foggy Bottom, and you can't afford to live in Foggy Bottom on an assistant professor's salary, even today. Okay. And my vision of being a faculty member was to ride my bike to campus and have students say, oh, Dr. Frank, would you sit under the tree and talk physiology with me? <laughs> Isn't that what they do here? No. Or, or is that over in the bars on Bourbon no Street? Trees. There's no trees here. No, okay. uh, instead, I was in my car driving in from Gaithersburg, Maryland, spending an hour in the car, listening to national public radio, listening, reading the Washington Post, learning about science policy, and I got bit by what I call Potomac fever, and I tried to figure out what I was going to do. And as a result of that, I ended up making another move after three years on the faculty at GW. Uh, I actually had looked at, in, looked at the AAAS Congressional Fellowship, which is something you may want to consider, uh, and we'll talk about that later. Uh, but it was getting paid less than I was getting paid as an assistant professor, and by then I had a child uh, and a house and uh, couldn't afford to do that. 
I actually interviewed for a Stein staff position up on Capitol Hill, which would have been a lot of fun, but I also realized that the hours were crazy up there. Uh, and I had a child and a wife and a house, and I actually wanted to come home and be able to see him as opposed to midnight every night uh, on legislation that wasn't going to get passed anyway. Or maybe they got passed back then. Nowadays, they don't get back. Uh, and ultimately, contacted NIH. NIH used to have a program called the STEP program, Staff Training for Extramural uh, Programs, uh, designed to basically take bench scientists put them at the NIH for a year and rotate them around various aspects of NIH to learn about what it means to be an extramural administrator. And I interviewed for the job, uh, had two great, interviewed by three people at the NIH, had two great interviews. The third person who interviewed me was a shrink. Uh, you know what happened. Uh, and I didn't get into that, but coincidentally, the Division of Research Grants, which is now the Center for Scientific review, uh, was looking for an executive secretary, which is now the scientific review officer, uh, to come in and take over the physiology study section because Clara Hamilton was retiring. Asked around and decided to do it. I figured I'd do two years, have two years as a research administrator, three years as an assistant professor, and that would translate opportunity to be an associate professor at a better university than GW. GW was not a research intensive department. Uh, lo and behold, I discovered that nobody was running through the halls of a biophysical society meeting, and my apologies for mentioning the society other than APS, but uh, that's a meeting I used to go to. Uh, looking for Marty Frank's latest research presentation. But there were a lot of people running through the halls looking to talk to Marty Frank about research funding. And that's why I always say life is an ego game. We do what we do because it strokes our ego. Uh, I realized I was never going to win the Nobel Prize. But what I realized is I could do more for physiology as a research administrator than I ever was going to do at the lab. And I think that's the hallmark of my career is I spent seven years running the physiology study section. Uh, during the course of that time, uh, I also set up my own personal professional development program with the agreement of my supervisors. So take the initiative when you're given the opportunity to do it, to learn new skills. And I rotated through four different institutes and worked with individual leaders and directors of NIH institutes to learn different aspects of the administrative structure of NIH. The fact that I had done that contributed to the fact that I got into the Department of Health and Human Services SES Candidate Development Program, which was designed to make middle managers into SES leaders, and SES are big muckety-mucks in government. Uh, and while I was in there, uh, working in the office of the Assistant Secretary of Health, uh, working with uh, Ed Brandt, who was the OASH, at the, headed up OASH at the time from Texas, my wife saw the advertisement for my job in Science Magazine. And my wife said, Marty, you're a physiologist, why don't you apply? I said, no, no, no. I'm in the NCS Candidate Development Program. I'm going to be a big muckety muck in government. A couple of weeks later, Cheryl saw the ad again. She said, Marty, why don't you apply for the job? And one of the things, I've been married 44 years now, so it's been a long time for marriage. But one of the things I've learned over those years, probably the only thing if you ask my wife, uh, is that if my wife tells me to do something once, I can blow it off. If she tells me to do it a second time, Marty, take the garbage out already, I go and do it. So I applied for the job, and the rest is history, and I became executive director of the APS. And it's been really a great experience, because I am a physiologist, and I've been able to see the society grow, improve, contribute to your development, to your careers, and ultimately be a positive force in the scientific community. Uh, as an executive director, my role is to serve as a catalyst and facilitator. Gabby will probably say I was also responsible for acting as a pain in the derriere. Uh, to provide administrative continuity, to be familiar with the membership's re research, 
provide a scientific voice on Capitol Hill and with the press. And right now, to manage 75 employees with an annual budget of about $19 million. And when I came on board at APS, our annual budget was $4 million. So we clearly have grown the program thanks to an increasing membership base, but really as a result of our scientific journal program. So let's talk about you. How many of you are graduate students? And how many of you are postdocs? And how many of you are questioning what you're going to do when you get done? <laughs> Even some of the faculty raised their hand. <laughs> Let me just say there are no right answers. Okay. You're going to make a mistake. We all make mistakes in our lives. And as I said, my first post-op, in hindsight, I consider it to be a toxic environment. There was a professor whose grant I was supporter now. There was a postdoc, and there was a technician. And then there was me, who coincidentally, there was not room in the laboratory for me to set up. And I was across the hall in undeveloped space. Uh, and I knew it was a wrong place for me at the time when I came in to the lab and there was a conference of the three of them in the boss's office and they forgot to tell me about it. Uh, and so I never necessarily felt loved, as they said. Uh, so I changed. But there's lots of career opportunities. Obviously there's numerous questions available to ask of nature and a multitude of tools to be used and that's dependent on research funding. And so let's hopefully we can work together uh, to advocate for biomedical research support. There are career options that exist in academia and in industry, biotechnology and the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, so there is a wealth of opportunity, but increasingly highly competitive opportunities. And so we'll talk a little bit about what else can one do with a PhD, and I think that's important. There are career options in many non-traditional areas requiring the translation of current science into lay language. So there are lots of things that each and every one of us can do with our professional degrees. So what's shaping funding and employment? Obviously, federal funding for R&D has stagnated since the Bush administration. That was the end of the doubling. And we're still roughly around $30 billion for the NIH support. In spite of the many promises we hear from our elected officials about how much support they're willing to give to NIH. The Obama administration, well, I think I was enthusiastic, more enthusiastic initially, but they've claimed support. They did give, get us the arrow money, uh, but for the most part, it's only been lift service. But I don't necessarily uh, blame Obama directly. We have a Congress that doesn't know how to pass, pass a budget. They don't know how to pass legislation. So even if he wanted to get something done, I'm not sure the Republican Congress will let him get anything done. Uh, lots of uncertainty, sequestration, and beyond. Theoretically, we're supposed to have sequestration again for the 2016 budget. Federal deficits have proven detrimental to expansion of all programs, not just science. Industrial funding seems to be growing faster than federal R&D. And clearly, international competitors are increasing funding. Uh, we see that in China, we see that in India. Even Germany uh, is increasing the amount of money that's going on. What shall we do with all the PhDs? Well, if we look at uh, 66 to 2011, uh, the vast majority of doctoral degrees awarded in biology and medical sciences by status, uh, about 60, 500 uh, were awarded in 2012, I think, uh, to U.S. citizens, another 2,000 to temporary, and some people don't claim their citizenship for whatever reason, or at least the NSF doesn't track it, couldn't find it. Uh, so we have lots of folks getting their PhD, and you can see from in the 40 years, in a 50-year period, we've gone from about 2,500 all the way up to 9,000 PhDs. Let's look at the skills needed in academia and industry. And what I would say is the skills you need in academia, the skills you need in industry are the same. Uh, the ability to collaborate across disciplines in various settings, 
and to learn fields beyond one specialty, especially in the industry. Uh, you may get a PhD like I did doing EC coupling and cardiac muscle, and you may be able to start an industry doing something of that nature. But lo and behold, if they need a body in another area, you may find yourself learning new techniques to be of value to industry. You need to have the ability to adapt quickly under changing conditions. You have to have the ability to work well in teams and demonstrate leadership skills. And just like in academia, you have to have the ability to work with people from different cultures. Uh, and I think that's critically important. If we look at where PhDs are getting employed these days, looking at academic, industry, government, and other categories, what we see is the PhD opportunities in academia are diminishing from 73 to 2010. It's gone from nearly 70% of PhDs getting jobs in academia to only about 50% of those getting opportunities in academia. The position opportunities are increasing in industry from about 12% to probably about 30% of the opportunities. And for most, the most part, government opportunities have re remained fairly stagnant. In 2010, less than 50% of PhD scientists worked in academia. A fraction of these individuals had jobs in research universities. LSU is a research university. So if you have a job here, you are in a research university. But the vast majority of PhDs are getting jobs in liberal arts colleges and junior community. And so there are countless uh, institutions out there where PhDs can contribute. Uh, if you're looking at academia uh, and you can't get a job at a research intensive university, look at a small college. Uh, you clearly end up having to do teaching more so than you would have to do in an academic medical school. Uh, but sometimes some of you are very good at teaching, and it's really a nice opportunity to stimulate bright minds who are interested in science. Uh, because the bottom line is everybody isn't going to become a scientist, but we do hope that everybody walks away from their education with an appreciation of science that can contribute to the betterment of society. So I think you can do a lot in that environment. The age of first PhD, first non-postdoctoral job, first tenure track job is interesting to look at, especially when you compare biomedical sciences versus chemistry. Uh, for the most part, PhD degree is around 31 in biological sciences, biomedical sciences. It's only about 29 in chemistry. The uh, age at first non-postdoctoral job, about 36, about 33 for chemistry, and for tenure track job, it's actually a drop down here, but it had been 37 or higher, uh, yet for chemistry, it's still around 33. So I guess if you want to get out in the working world early, get a PhD in chemistry as opposed to biomedical sciences. But the fact of the matter is, get a PhD in whatever discipline satisfies your curiosity and will make you and help you get up in the morning to get into the lab to do your research. The average age of first-time R01 equivalent investigators, uh, PhDs around 42. This is based on NIH data. MD PhDs and MDs alone, more like 44, 45. Uh, it's hard to get, a PA, get your PhD. It's hard to get that first grant. Uh, and as I said, the first award is right around 42 now. The distribution of academically employed biomedical PhDs by tenure status. Uh, tenured uh, faculty have dropped from about 50 to about 38%. Uh, tenure track uh, is about 20% here, 18%, and about the same here as well. So, if you look at tenure versus and tenure track positions, it's gone from about 68% down to about 55% of PhDs in academia. Postdocs uh, have been roughly 10 to 15% of those positions. And for those of us who have been in faculty position, uh, other academic positions uh, probably related to the growth 
of the deandums, the vice deans, and the vice vice deans, uh, as well as related to federal regulations and oversight that have to be abided by. We've seen an increasing growth in the academic uh, uh, administrative end of academia. The percent of U.S. biomedical science PhDs holding tenure or tenure, tenure track positions, five to six years postdoc. Uh, 1981, it was almost 35 percent. Today, it's about 15 percent. Yes, sir. Is that because there are actually less positions available, or is this kind of a uh, In part, they're they're linked, but in part, it is because of the fact that there are fewer positions. Uh, back in 1986, uh, retirement no longer became mandatory for academics. Uh, and so there are lots of folks in academic positions, many of them very productive, many of them not, who are still sitting at their desks on salary. Uh, and it does reduce the opportunity for young people coming out. But it, clearly the funding situation hasn't helped. You know, it's been 12 years now since the doubling end of 2003. And basically we haven't seen any increase in funding, yet the number of PhDs that we're producing has continued to increase, which makes it so much more competitive to get money uh, from research grants. Medical school faculty by degree and department, uh, not surprising. Uh, what we see is <coughs> down here are the MDs in basic science department, not a lot. Most PhDs end up in basic, or there a large number of the most, let me rephrase it, the largest number of professionals in a basic science department are PhDs with a few MDs and a few MD PhDs. Clinical departments, mostly MDs, although you will find lots of opportunities for PhDs in clinical science departments, primarily because a clinician who has a research program <coughs> also has to see patients. So oftentimes PhDs are brought in as research faculty to help run the research program. So those are other opportunities. So, what are we looking for? Employers are seeking individuals who are independent, problem solvers, quantitative thinkers, and articulate communicators. They are seeking individuals who have carried out complex projects, overcome obstacles through creative thinking, and operated with a minimum of supervision. And at least as far as I'm concerned, that's a PhD. Uh, so if you've got your PhD, you fit the bill in all these quarters. So there are five hiring attributes that I think are critically important as you move on in your career. Uh, adaptability. Can you adjust to new rules, new demands, new people, and new environments? I have to get a new president every year. Uh, am I adaptable? She's not answering. Okay. The answer has been had. You have to be collaborative. You have to recognize when he or she is the best person for the task and when it's critical to join others and work as part of a team. You have to be an adept problem solver. Don't hesitate to fix a problem. Too many of us see a problem and do nothing about it, so you have to be able to do that. Humility. Uh, you have to know, or you, you know your talents. You don't need to broadcast them to fellow employees or to their superior. If you're doing a good job, other people will recognize it without you having to go in to tell your boss, hey, I'm doing a good job, which is why I have to tell the president. <laughs> uh, leadership. Intuitively, intuitively know the appropriate time to step in or step back. Focus on the project's success, not on a rigid leadership structure. And I think that's the one nice thing I can say about the APS presidents. I've been running the society for 30 years. Every single one of those presidents has one thought in mind, and that is to see the society advance and contribute to its advancement through the programs that they help shepherd in the programs we currently have. And so they're part of a team, they show leadership, 
and they step up and help this organization grow. How many of you have uh, filled out uh, IDP? I think a number of you have. Does that everybody know what an IDP is? Uh, it's an individual development plan. It is something that actually was developed uh, by Phil Clifford, uh, professor of physiology at Medical College of Wisconsin, uh, that he started with us, began working with FASA and AAAS, and now it is broadly disseminated. And it will help you define who you are and the skills you have in order to make sure that you identify where you end up once you get your PhD. Uh, I think most telling is this conversation between the Cheshire Cat and Alice in Wonderland. Uh, Alice says, would you tell me please which way I ought to walk from here? That depends a good deal on where you want to get to, said the cat. I don't much care where, and it doesn't matter which way you walk, said the cat. So long as I get somewhere, Alice added. Oh, you're sure to do that, said the cat, if you only walk long enough. The IDP is a way to help you, help guide you in your walk. So do take the time and fill one out. And you can get it here at uh, myidpsciencecareers.org. The IDP provides exercises to help you examine your skills and interests and values. It provides a list of 20 scientific career paths with a prediction of which ones best fit your skills and interests. It provides a tool for setting strategic goals for the coming year with optional reminders to keep you on track. And it provides articles and resources to guide you through the process. So do go to myidpsciencecareers.org. And if you haven't filled one out, please do it. Uh, those people who have done it already, raise your hand so people can consult you if they have any questions. Okay, look around. Feel free to talk to some of the people. I'm checking, making sure that... You know, this it, it, it's much more effective than, I don't know about anybody else, but when I went to the University of Illinois, they had career guidance as well. Uh, and how many of you were told you should do something that you're not doing today? I was told I should be a forest ranger. I, I don't think I've accomplished that. Now, with a PhD, there are lots of opportunities for you. And, and this is really the crux of today's discussion. Um, patent law. And there's two ways to get into patent law. Number one, uh, you can go to a patent law firm. And oftentimes they will hire PhDs to help them review patent applications. Uh, and if you're lucky, uh, that law firm may actually send you for your law degree. Uh, and I will tell you, patent attorneys are probably the uh, highest compensated attorneys out there. So it's not so bad. Uh, but there's another way you can get into it, is to become a patent agent uh, through the US PTO, US Patent and Trademark Office. Uh, go to the US PTO website. Uh, you can take an exam to become a patent examiner, a patent agent. Uh, you work in Washington, DC, uh, at least that's headquarters. Today, you actually do a lot of it remotely because all patents are now online. The old days, you had to go into the files and dig through them and try and find out if the patent application you were reviewing is a new one or not, or is it uh, duplicative of something that's been done previously. You now get to do that all online, so you can actually end up working remotely probably after the first year and you develop the skills. Uh, you become a patent examiner, also, as I said, in the Patent and Trademark Office. Tech transfer. Uh, I was just in the conference room uh, for, uh, for neuroscience here. Uh, there are a lot of patents there. And if he was on faculty here when those patents were filed, clearly the tech transfer office here had a hand in that. And if you have any interest in tech transfer, uh, one of the things I encourage people to do we, we all spend our time in our laboratories. We're all doing our research uh, because our advisors and colleagues expect that of us. But theoretically, you don't have to work 24-7, theoretically. Uh, so take some time, walk around the university, 
stop in and visit the dean associated with tech transfer or some of the other departments we're going to talk about and find out what they do. Learn from them. Do what's known as an interview of them and find out what their careers are and the career tracks are. Because don't set your goals on doing something without knowing what you're going to be doing. Uh, you may decide you don't want to push paper all the time. You may decide you prefer to be in the laboratory. And having these conversations are, is most beneficial as you go forward. Uh, so explore opportunities at your university, gain experience, understanding of the process. Uh, investment analysis, develop experience to advise Wall Street on profitability of startups and IPOs. Now you say, I've got a PhD in physiology, how's that going to help? Well, the nice thing is physiology is a quantitative science. And if you can do math and do analysis, a lot of, law, a lot of brokerage houses are looking for scientists. Indeed, probably one of the amazing things is PhDs in physics oftentimes end up on Wall Street because they can model the, the market and help them understand what the opportunities are for ups and downs in, in the stock market. Uh, being a scientist, understanding physiology and pharmacology can contribute to an understanding of whether or not an IPO for a company is going to be a success or not because you can provide them with insights and advice on whether or not the, the drug that they're developing is actually translatable into something that's going to be a blockbuster or not. So there is a role for PhDs to give advice up on Wall Street. Obviously, make the call, talk to people, explore. There are a number of people up there who you can get advice from. In business, uh, you can earn an MBI, help launch a biotech for work in venture capital or life sciences consulting. I don't think it happens here, uh, but there are a number of academic institutions that as you're getting your PhD, you can also spend a year to get an MBA. And that makes you very marketable when you go out into the business world. Uh, you have the scientific skills you need to be a successful scientist, but you have business skills and MBA that will help you contribute to the advancement of that company. So it's something to explore uh, and consider. And there are a number of uh, online MBA programs as well, so that if you want it, you can do that as well. I personally would say stay away from Strayer in the University of Phoenix uh, and a few others. Uh, if you're going to do an online, try and do it from a reputable institution. Science journalism, you can start as a freelance reporter for print or TV. You can blog about science. You can do a AAAS Mass Media Fellowship. Uh, that's one of the fellowships that APS supports. It puts you, usually for a summer, into a media outlet. It could be TV, it could be radio, it could be print. Uh, but it's an opportunity to get your hands into writing for the public. The other thing you can do is, I'm assuming, uh, the university has a newspaper here uh, in which there are articles about the scientists who are doing research here. Uh, volunteer to be a cub reporter and to write a few articles. Get a feel for it, see if you like doing it. Uh, the Picayune Times, right? Uh, I haven't looked at the huh? Sometimes Picayune, okay. Yeah, didn't they stop printing it for a while? Do they still print it or not? Okay. okay. Uh, so how, do you, how do you wrap your garbage in? Anyway. Uh, but anyways, you can go to them and see about writing articles for science or start a science blog. Uh, but if you're interested in writing about science, what you need to do is get some experience and you've got the ability to do it. Technical writing, medical writing for a pharma and biotech company. How many times have we gone into the doctor's office and they've handed you the little brochure before they give you the drug that the sales rep had told them is going to solve the problems that you have? You know, somebody's got to write those, and PhDs oftentimes aren't involved with writing. In education, pre-college, opportunities to stimulate young minds. I don't know about anybody else, but in my high school in Chicago, my chemistry professor, I assume had a PhD, I called, his name is Dr. Davidson. Uh, and if you like teaching uh, and you don't mind 
snap-nosed teenagers, uh, you can go to teach in high school and teach science course. And I think you can find it very gratifying. In metropolitan areas, oftentimes somebody teaching with a PhD gets a salary that's equivalent to an assistant professor. Uh, and guess what? You get Christmas off, you get summers off, you get spring vacation, something you don't get in academia. So if you're interested in teaching, it's an opportunity to consider. The federal government, you, you've heard about me and my opportunities in the federal government. You can serve as a program officer at NIH or NSF. You can serve as a science staff on a congressional committee. Do look at AAAS fellowships in science and technology policy or congressional science and engineering fellows. You can work in city and state government science, similar to federal opportunities, because there are many legislative opportunities related to science in, in state and city government. And you can work in nonprofit associations, uh, science policy analysts, education programs, as CEOs. Uh, I'm going to retire someday. Anybody want my job, feel free to apply. Uh, let me just talk a little about, about Congress and state government. It's not easy to get a job in a congressional office. They always have lots of people who want to volunteer. Uh, the average age of a staff member in a House of Representative office is 25 years of age. So all of you are already too old. Okay. The average age for a Senate office is 28. Uh, so for the most part, kids get their bachelor's degrees, they go in there, they start working. But the other aspect of it is if you develop a relationship with your representative or your senator such that you're writing them, you're telling them about science, you're telling them about discovery, you're expressing stuff, you're not complaining all the time, but you're trying to give positive feedback. When you go to Washington, D.C., and you stop in and visit him or her or talk to their staff member, or when they come to the district here in New Orleans, make time when they're going to be in the district to talk to them. That's a way to get your foot in the door to work in a congressional office. Because indeed a lot of what goes on relates to science, even if legislation doesn't get passed in. The same thing goes for state government. If you have a passion for government and you want to use your science to advance the scientific mission of the state or the city, whether it's uh, climate change, or pollution, or water policy, here oil in effect on the environment, you can use your PhD advantageously to benefit legislative opportunities. So don't be shy. Talk to people who are in elected position. See about even volunteering on occasion to work in their office, to look at certain studies, etc. They'll get to know you and maybe the opportunity to get into a congressional office. Uh, for non-traditional career opportunities, check out uh, Science Magazine, Science Career, Science Mag. Check out the career pages at APS. And I believe I sent a chapter that I wrote in a book called Career Options for Biomedical Sciences Scientists. It just came out. Uh, I wrote my chapter about a year and a half ago and I discovered the problem of multi-authored texts. Doesn't do you any good to be the first one in the door. Uh, it took another 18 months before the last chapter came in before they could publish it. Uh, but it is out, it will be reviewed uh, in the March issue of The Physiologist. Uh, one of our PhDs in our science policy office actually reviewed it and I told her that she didn't have to say anything nice about me. Uh, in my chapter, and she didn't. Uh, she will be looking for a new job shortly. Uh, but I do encourage you to take a look at it. Uh, and basically, it happens about 20 chapters, and people in diff with PhDs in different careers talk about their careers, how they got their opportunities, recommendations, and so on. So, now that I've told you about what you can do, let's talk about a few lessons that will make you succeed. Lesson number one, to ensure your success, be well-rounded in your career. And I say that most importantly because scientists traditionally are perceived as introverts. They live within the walls of their lab. Uh, they don't know anything about anybody or anything. 
be an extrovert. Get to know people outside the lab. So get involved, get engaged. Don't just focus on the test tube and the blot. Focus on yourself and expand your horizons. Involve yourself in activities outside of your laboratory. As I said, hone your skills in communications, management, finance, and community outreach. If you live in a community, sign up to be a representative to the community association. Be the treasurer, be the secretary. Do something that's going to help you develop a skill. If you have problems with the English language, sign up for Toastmasters or something else that is going to force you to stand up and communicate to the people around you. Uh, because clearly, the important thing is to be able to communicate our science and communicate what we do. Allow your advisors to assist you in preparing you for the real world. Don't be afraid to ask. I think every single one of your advisors wants to see you grow. Yeah, we want you to become PhDs like ourselves and become scientists. But I think most of us all recognize that those opportunities aren't necessarily there anymore. And so I think every single one of us is willing to work with you and help you grow in your career, whether it's as a bench scientist, as a teacher, as a patent attorney, or whatever it is. We want you to succeed because it's like, you're, like our children. You are a reflection of us. We want our kids to succeed. You are our academic children. We want you to succeed. Lesson number two, nurture the skills that come with your doctorate. Scholarship, the ability to discover, integrate, and apply knowledge. The ability to communicate and disseminate knowledge. The ability to be a critical thinker and problem solver. And remember, it's your intellect, skills, and goals that lead you to a career. So clearly, be able to communicate. Lesson number three, serendipity is an important part of a job search. Be prepared to recognize opportunities and act fast by adapting your job search materials to each opening. Nothing worse for Dr. Molina to get a letter to say, I saw the advertisement for the position at Tulane University. Okay? Read the letter before you send it. Don't take that letter that you sent to Tulane for a job and repurpose it and send it to LSU or another university, okay? And do me the other favor, one of my pet peeves, when I get a letter with typos, I basically set it aside. If you don't have the time to proofread what you sent me, I don't have the time to read your application. And I'm not sure if everybody's like that. Uh, my staff hates it when they give me something to sign because I don't know why, I don't proofread things necessarily, but those mistakes always jump out of the page of me. And it goes back to, to, to be redone. Uh, lesson number four, your first job is not your last job, but an opportunity to gain some new skills that will serve you as you move forward. Every job is a stepping stone to the next job. My first postdoc, was a stepping stone to the next and ultimately to where I am today. Uh, we all make mistakes and keep that in mind. You're going to take a job and you're going to hate it. But what you need to do is make the most of it for as long as you're there. But that does not preclude you for looking for another job. Uh, don't say, I hate my job and I'm not going to do anything. Because guess what? Somebody's going to call your boss and say, what was she like when she was working there? Oh, she was sullen. She didn't seem to like coming into the office. And that's going to hurt you a couple of years down the road when you're looking for another job. People are always blaming their circumstances for what they are. I don't believe in circumstances. This is from Mrs. Warren's profession, George Bernard Shaw. The people who get on in this world are the people who get up and look for the circumstances they want. And if they can't find them, make them. You are the determiner of what you're going to be. Opportunities are created by you. So you take advantage of the circumstances that are presented to you. Lesson number five from a movie in 2006, Pursuit of Happiness. Don't ever let somebody tell you you can't do something. You can do anything you want as long as you set your mind to it. 
I think that's a critically important thing. Lesson number six, be prepared and the world will be your oyster. And on that note, I will say thank you and I will wish you each success in your career and aspirations to be whatever you want to be. Thank you. We have time for one or two questions. We already moved late, so if you have any more than one or two questions, yeah, I never know how long. Dr. Frank I, I, I never know how many stories to tell to fill in the time. Questions, comments? Yeah, if there's no questions, then that concludes our. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, John. <Ryan. laughs> I'm not going anywhere, so if anybody has any questions, I'll I'll turn the mic off. So when you come up and tell me, you know, I really hate my boss, but can you help me get out of this? <laughs> so we're not, I don't think we're being kicked out of this room, so if anybody has a question and you would not be comfortable asking it out loud, um, there's time for you to come up front and we can have a small discussion as you wish. And the bottom line, for those of you who know me, uh, or those of you who don't, you can send me an email. Uh, sadly, I am too compulsive and too responsive to emails, uh, and so you're more than likely to get a response from me. Uh, I, I passed a resolution this year that I was not going to do any email on the weekend. Last weekend was a three-day weekend, right? And then I'm sitting there doing email. My wife said, what the hell are you doing? I said, there's too much going on. i got to do it. I can try. Uh, EB this year is going to be in uh, Boston. There are numerous sessions available on what I will call a career track. And that career track is not just a career track uh, offered by the American Physiological Society. We normally have a number of sessions. I can't give you chapter and verse of what the sessions are. Uh, but one of the things that we did with the experimental biology meeting about four or five years ago is we realized that each society was offering career sessions. And we actually, and we also have the FASA MARC program there as well. And that's in the, what I'll call the uh, employment area. Uh, and they have a number of courses as well to help you write your resume. They'll actually look at your resume to help you review it. Uh, but we now have a career development track. And so I would encourage you to go to the experimental biology website, uh, look at the career development track, see what sessions are being offered, uh, because there is a wealth of opportunity there. Uh, there are also APS stocking caps and scarves because it's going to be cold in, in Boston. And those are for sale online and also at the exhibit. John, you had a question? Yeah, I was wondering if you could say a few words. So I, I like the skills that you presented that in graduate school and as scientists, if you could say how you could essentially if you're differenti differentiating yourself from other PhDs who might be paying for a similar job, as opposed to saying I have a PhD and here's all the people who haven't gotten the skills that you're Well if you're if you're staying in academia, as you well know, the measure of success is defined by the papers that you publish in the grant. Uh, if you're looking for a non-traditional career, bottom line is perseverance is a real thing, okay? You can do anything, as I said. We can all do anything. The real key is convincing that person that you can do what they're looking for. And I don't have an easy answer to that, okay? Uh, it's really having the confidence to go into a job with the understanding that you have the skill set to take on the tasks that are being thrown your way. The most important thing that you do when you interview for your job, we all know what it's like to interview for an academic job. You're going to go, you're going to give your seminar, you're going to talk to all the other faculty, you're going to smile a lot, your face is going to hurt by the end of the day. Uh, but the bottom line is we all know how to operate in that. 
what you really need to do is have that confidence and conviction that you've got the skill set and you have to know enough about the organization that when you go in there you can speak to what they're looking to do. Uh, I have a, you know, my career is a very interesting one. I didn't expect to become the executive secretary for the physiology studies actually. I got a call from the deputy director saying, we have a job for you, come on down. That was it. Not even an interview. They were looking for a PhD. I was in the system. It was easy. When it came time to interview for the job at APS, I didn't need a job. I was going to be a big muckety muck and okay. uh, I will give you an aside or two. Uh, I interviewed in Lexington, Kentucky. I asked a guy named Mike Jackson, who was a professor of physiology with me at GW, uh, how I should handle the interview. Tell me about the society. I was a member since 76, but wasn't involved in the society. Uh, and Mike said, Marty, what you want to do, get drunk, put your feet up on the table, and say, I'm good, why should I come and work for you? Now, my interview was at 11 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> And I don't drink that early, even if it's 5 o'clock somewhere. But the first, the, the search committee uh, was former members of council and presidents. Uh, the head of the search committee was a guy named Al Fishman. Uh, the president at the time of the interview was Jack West. Uh, Walt Randall former Chair of Physiology at Loyola, Frank Knox, Chair of Physiology at, Knox, at Mayo, uh, Howard Morgan, Chair of Physiology at Hershey Medical School. Uh, they were all on the search. The title of my job was not Executive Director. The old title was Executive Secretary Treasurer. And Walt Randall asked me the first question. Dr. Frank, do you have any experience being a treasurer? And Marty being Marty said, no, my wife handles the checkbook. <laughs> Clearly, I'm on a good track for this interview. I realized maybe that was the wrong answer. I said, wait, wait, that may be not be the right answer. I'm a physiologist. I know how to spend money. I don't know how to manage money. I nailed it with that answer, right? There was one other question for those of you who have not been privy to my past history. I used to do professional clowning. Uh, I worked at NIH and I started entertaining the kids on the pediatric oncology floor. All as a result of the fact that I looked to hire a clown for my daughter's sixth birthday. And afterwards I said, for 50 bucks I can do a better job than this guy can do any day. So I became a clown. Uh, Frank Knox, who became president in 87, uh, sitting at the end of the table asking me a question about my ability to interact with Congress. And I said, well, Jelly Bean Clown is not germane. Uh, how my alter ego helped me interact. And I said, Jelly Bean Clown is not germane to whether or not I can interact with the clowns up on Capitol Hill. I will tell you, those are the th only three responses that I remember making. Okay. But I walked out of the interview knowing I was going to get the job offer. Okay. John, I don't have an answer for you. <laughs> uh, I gave a talk when uh, Joey Granche was president, going to be president down at University of Mississippi, and after the talk he said, well, tell us about your interviews and how to deal with rejection. I said, I thought about it. I said, Joey, I've never been rejected. Okay, I've been fortunate. Uh, you're going to get rejected. Uh, Bottom line, you go in there with the confidence that says to the person who's, being, who's doing the interview that you can do the job. Uh, clearly, my smart ass answers were enough to get APS to think that I could do the job, and I'm still trying to do it, so we'll see what happens. There's a question over here. It was just a real quick question. I noticed I registered for EV two weeks ago, and all the career development kind of workshops were already sold out. Oh, really? Yeah, so I wanted to bring it to the attention and, and, and say, you know, I know that there are going to be people between now and the conference that are going to want to attend that and maybe open up another session that's going to be great. 
Yeah, yeah well, I, and when I go back, I'll talk to Jackie. Now, those are the sessions within the MARC program, and but there are other sessions as well that are being offered. So, okay. you know, yeah, look at those. Each society, I think we have a half dozen sessions that I would call career related uh, on our program, and I think each of the other societies has something. So, okay. anybody else? If there are no other questions, thank you for listening to me. Uh, thank you for either being an APS member or considering becoming an APS member. Uh, it's a good society, if I must say so myself, right? So, anyways, thank you much. Thank you.